you talk about writing the book itself? You know, it's, it's conversational. But in, in, in what sense do you, do you write something and try to get the exact imagery of an emotion you had personally, you know? Well, the thing is, I'd never written this type of book before. And I didn't know if I could. So when I started writing, I sort of aspired to do a few things. One, to be as honest as I could. And two, to not waste people's time. You know, so I wanted to write something that was entertaining and honest. And hopefully in the process, I mean, I hope that I've, I hope I've also written it well. But when I first started out, I didn't know what was gonna happen. And it's been, it's been a really interesting experience. Like just writing the book is like this great form of self-diagnostic therapy. And then you put a book out into the world and you start talking about yourself and your experiences and like everyone you talk to becomes almost like an ad hoc therapist. Um, one of the things, you know, besides writing, uh, we understand you also did the audiobook yourself. Now what's that process like putting your own words back through your mouth again? I thought doing an audiobook would be the easiest thing in the world. You know, I thought simply I would just read my own book and it would take a couple of hours and it would be super easy. Surprisingly, recording the audiobook was really annoying because in normal conversation, we make mistakes. We stumble on words, we mispronounce things, and it's fine. But when you're recording an audiobook, you can't do any of that. And so I kept making mistakes. Like every 30 seconds, I would make another mistake and have to like edit and edit and edit and edit. So it's, uh, I don't know if I'll be recording an audiobook again. Yeah. Maybe if you do a children's book or something. <laughs> yeah, something with like a couple of hundred words, not 150,000 words. Yeah. Moby's poetic stanzas. Yeah, my, I, I do need to join that long tradition of musicians writing books of bad poetry. <laughs> uh, now, before you rewrote it, did you have anyone you kind of wanted to aspire to be who wrote an autobiography or a biography itself that you read that you said, that's kind of what I want to aim for? Yes, uh, because before I wrote the book, I went out and read as many biographies and memoirs as I could, and I didn't like most of them. Most of the ones I encountered, I felt like they weren't generous enough or they weren't honest enough. But then I read John Cheever's journals. And John Cheever is one of my favorite writers of all time, and he wrote these journals that are so honest, like unflinchingly, disconcertingly honest, and I sort of then thought to myself, if John Cheever, one of my favorite writers of all time, can write this brutally honest book, then I can at the very least try and write a brutally honest book. So he, of anyone, he was my biggest influence. So there was never any second thoughts after when the first draft was out about, you know, rewriting or, or pulling back on, you know, the, the sex, the drugs, prostitutes, anything like that. You kept that all in for the honesty's sake. Yeah. I mean, the only, I have no problem throwing myself under the bus. My only concern was writing anything that would hurt anyone else's feelings who's in the book. So I tried to be as respectful of other people as possible. Um, I didn't want to use this as an opportunity to grind axes and criticize people. I wanted it as an opportunity to sort of honestly describe what my life was like during these 10 years in the hope that maybe someone would read it and feel maybe more like more connected to another person and also more comfortable with maybe certain aspects of their life that up until that point they've been ashamed of you know because i'm it maybe it's just because i've been around for a while but i just find myself becoming increasingly tired of people being dishonest and I don't mean necessarily lying, I mean representing themselves as someone they're not. In this day of social media, say you say, you yeah. know. And, and, this, and also in just, I just feel like every, every musician, every public figure, like so many people are just trying to be something they're not, which is great when it's theatrical. You know, if someone's being like an over the top campy version of themselves, great. If it's theatrical, good. But if it's just someone trying to be cooler or tougher, or younger, or more blasé than they actually are. I'm just so bored of that. Like I want, I feel like the world needs people to at least aspire 
to be honest versions of themselves. Well, my issue is always when people try to live a, live a life outside that's not them at all, and they try to, like, they try to be that themselves, the hashtag of, you know, beast mode, I'm living the life and doing all that, you know. Mm -hmm. is it, do, you, do you have anger when you see that, or do you feel sadness when you see those kind of people? Well, uh, hmm. more sadness for our species, because if we think of it, there's seven billion of us on the planet, and we are burning through resources at a wholly unprecedented rate. You know, we are burning through all the fossil fuels and all the timber and all the oxygen and all the water, but no one's very happy. You know, like it's the worst kick in the teeth to our species. It's like we're ruining the planet and in the process, making ourselves miserable. You know, it's like we're having like the biggest, craziest party of seven billion people, but no one's enjoying it. Well, if you look online, we are everyone, but in real life, no one is. Uh, you know, it's funny uh, you come into that too, because we have a, a big green initiative too. And if I can ask, what what do you do to impart your your eco idea, or how do you be become more green in your life? Well, there are many ways that people keep people can be more green. Um, turn off the air conditioner, lower the thermostat, um, get an electric car, drive less. There are many, many ways, but for me, the most effective way of being more green is actually to stop using animals for food. And because traditionally, the way veganism has been presented has been for the animals. But I actually think it's worth considering veganism for us because animal agriculture contributes 51% of climate change, 40% of water use, 90% of rainforest deforestation, 50% of cancer, heart disease, diabetes, obesity, 75% of antibiotic resistance, 25% of ocean acidification. So like nothing is destroying the planet more than animal agriculture, but yet we subsidize it. And I'm not even criticizing people who eat meat and dairy. I'm just saying that our reliance on animal agriculture is literally killing us. I, I just be remiss if I ask one last question about EDM and the business itself. Um, looking back when you started, and you know, youth has kind of this artful hope to it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, how do you see the business of electronic dance music, not EDM, but electronic dance music as a whole right now? Well, there is. I mean, with electronic dance music, with music and art and culture in general, there is a long, difficult balance between the creative and the commercial. And it's hard to find a healthy balance between the creative and the commercial. Clearly, when something is just commercial, it's horrible. But at the same time, when something is maybe too creative, you know, if you're talking about like 11 minute saxophone solos, that doesn't work either. But if there's a balance, if you can find that balance between, or maybe not the commercial, but the populist and the creative, then you have the Rolling Stones, then you have Led Zeppelin, then you have Neil Young, then you have Public Enemy, then you have Nirvana. You know, when it, like when something is creative and earnest and beautiful, but populist at the same time, that's when the magic happens. But we all have to be super cautious in making sure that we don't go too far in either direction. All right. Well, I think that gets everything. So thank you very much, sir. I uh, hope you enjoy. Uh, you kind of mentioned a secret maybe showing at EDC itself. So hopefully we'll see you on stage somewhere. Who knows? I show up and I stand on a box, quite literally. You'll see. It's like, that, that's it. Yeah, with fireworks. <laughs> so it's like the middle-aged guy on a box and a bunch of fireworks. <laughs> yeah. We'll give them what they asked for, as I say. Yeah. yeah. Thank you.